I'm Lee Baker, back with another episode of Level Up with Lee. And we've got another great show in store for you today. You know, financial literacy is always an important topic, but in today's time where people are dealing with inflation, the price of gas at the pump, unfortunately here in Georgia where I'm located today, we're finally back under $4 a gallon for regular. But there's a lot more in the world of financial literacy that's important for all of us besides the price of gas at the pump. And today's guest, Mr. Rodney Brooks, is just a fountain of information. You know, Rodney's a, a veteran journalist, spent decades at USA Today and has written for any number of illustrious publications across the country and is the author of a new book. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So without any further ado, Rodney, uh, welcome to the show and uh, introduce yourselves to our viewers. Uh, thank, thank you for having me. So um, I was um, deputy managing editor of USA Today for, actually I left after 30 years. Um, and um, wow. but once I, I, um, once I retired, I started writing again. Um, and I've uh, written columns on retirement for the Washington Post, um, US News and World Report, uh, written for Black Enterprise and, and uh, National Geographic. Uh, so, um, and um, longtime member of the National Association of Black Journalists and I was elected to the NABJ Hall of Fame um, in December. Congratulations. That is, Thank that's you. an amazing uh, recognition, if you will. So congratulations on that. Now, in, in, in somewhere in there, I attended Georgetown to receive a certificate in uh, financial planning. So, okay. uh, <laughs> um, which, which, which sort of relates to why, why I focus on financial, um, financial planning a lot um, in my writing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good deal. So, um, so now, again, you're the author. The title of your new book is Fixing the Racial Wealth Gap, and we'll definitely want to touch on that. You know, so let's let's dive right in. What what, in your opinion, are some of the causes of this wealth gap? Well, you know, part of the title is uh, racism and discrimination put us here. But this is how we can save future generations. So, you know, it's hard to talk about all the problems Black Americans face with the racial wealth gap without talking about the history of why we are here. So that's why I started out talking about that. You know, during the racial, um, the racial justice protest, a lot was talked, uh, Tulsa was talked about a lot uh, and how, how Black Wall Street was basically burned to the ground, a, a thriving Black community was burned to the ground by an angry white mob. But, that played out in cities across the country. So whenever we've had black wealth, it has been taken away from us. I mean, that's one of the things, you know, if you look, I mean, and that happened in New York, Philadelphia, I mean, Detroit, it happened in cities all over the country. So that, you know, and then you look at things like housing and you look at the housing discrimination and redlining, um, housing wealth is a huge part of any family's wealth. Uh, and if you don't have the ability to build housing wealth, um, then you lose a big part of, you know, how you can acquire um, uh, wealth. Now, you know, um, one of the things I did write about, you know, related to housing wealth is, is when the GIs came back from World War II, you know, the GI Bill was passed to give them benefits. Um, but the, the um, states found ways to deny those benefits to Black veterans, um, you know, and if you look at communities like Levittown, which was built for veterans, um, Black veterans were not even allowed to live there. In fact, covenants were written that <laughs> to keep Black veterans out. So, you know, and so that's just one part, you know, we're talking about housing wealth and housing wealth is a huge part of your wealth. And, and that, that contributed a big part to, to the wealth gap, you know, without even getting into the income disparities. Gotcha, gotcha. And it's, it's interesting that you focus on uh, housing wealth and the lack thereof. One of the things that we're seeing currently uh, here in the country and have been for the last year and a half, two years post-COVID has been what seems like the absolute explosion in home prices. Do you see uh, what's happened here in the last two years 
perhaps closing that gap some, or do you think maybe it's making things worse? Um, without doubt, it's making without a doubt, it's making things worse. Uh, you know, even before you saw this rise in uh, housing prices, um, you saw the gap continuing to widen in black home ownership versus white home ownership. Um, um, about 71% of white, um, white families own their home, 71%. And that compares to about somewhere between 43 and 45% of black families. Okay. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the home ownership gap is not narrowing, it's actually widening. It was widening even before prices started to go up. So, so, um, so um, I would imagine if we look at it now, it would, it would probably be um, um, you know, um, even worse. Uh, there were stories um, before the pandemic that, um, that the uh, black home ownership rate was now even lower than it was before the Fair Housing Act in the 1960s. Okay, that's pretty grim. Right. Wow. That 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 is pretty grim indeed. So, um, but let's you know perhaps fast forward towards the end of the book. So some of the things that uh, we see, you know, things come up from time to time about things that can be done to help. Uh, close this wealth gap. You know, for years we've had companies like Aerial Partner with uh, other organizations and talk about this gap. From your perspective, what are some of the things that we might be able to do to help begin to close that gap? So, um, you know, some of the things are okay. Let me talk about financial literacy first because I'm sure, absolutely passionate about it. Uh, because some of the things I think we can do, but some of the things. Uh, some of the things I think have to be done by the government. So I'm going to focus on financial literacy first. Um, um, high on my list is always <laughs> talk to your children about finances. Okay. Um, Don Kelly, uh, who is uh, who owns a uh, uh, former Prudential uh, financial executive who owns a business in uh, Queens, New York, talk, talks, in the, I interviewed her for the book, and she talked about her how her mother, uh, when she was a little girl, um, made her write the checks to pay the bills. So uh, that way, she said, um, I never asked for anything because I knew there was nothing left after I wrote the checks. <laughs> um, oh, man, I love that. I um, love that. But, Black families, especially, um, it's, it's almost taboo to talk about about you know what you, what what you're paying, you know what you're earning with your children, and it's missing. Um, you know the these dinner time conversations uh, that 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 white families have um, about finances. Uh, we need to do that more. So so one is talk to your children um, about, uh, stop being afraid to talk to them about what you're paying for your mortgage or your rent um, and let them, uh, and help them understand, um, help them understand finances. You know, um, so high on my list is, is, uh, is get a financial planner. I mean, you know, People, people assume that you have to be a millionaire to get a financial planner, but- right. uh, uh, but, you know, it's amazing how much a financial planner can help somebody, especially if they start young. And, um, and you, and the, you know, uh, as you know, um, many financial planners um, um, provide services pro bono at, uh, you know, churches, community centers. So um, I say connect, if connect with a financial planner or someone who can, who can give you some advice because one, uh, you know, another thing we need to do is, is, uh, is, is uh, invest. If we don't invest, Black Americans don't invest, you know, 60% um, um, of White families invest in the market compared to thirty something percent of black families. Um, so we need to be aware. So financial literacy, investing, um, and um, you know, um, and then you know, another thing I talk about is credit. You know, um, you know, being aware of your credit scores, which which uh, can can raise interest rates dramatically if you don't have a good credit score. And uh, so, you know, so 
It can affect how much rent you pay, how much your mortgage is, how much your car note is. And um, so we should be focusing on watching our credit scores and um, and trying to do what we can to raise them. So because uh, higher interest rates can do a lot of damage. Um, now, let, when I talk now, let me talk about some of the big picture things. And, sure. you know, and, and one of them is um, is uh, baby bonds, which um, which Cory Booker has actually introduced legislation that would basically provide, um, let's just say, because there are several proposals out of here. And this is one of the, this was actually proposed by uh, um, a couple of economists, including uh, William Darity, at, uh, who's at Duke University, um, that basically any, every child born in the US would get, let's just say a thousand dollars, okay every year um, so you're born you get a thousand dollars you know and every you get it every year up until the age 18. now the amount of money that that you get would depend on on the income of your parents so the lower income people would end up with more with more money at the end of the day but you're basically getting like a savings bond um, so by the time you turn 18, you have the ability to have maybe a down payment on a car, um, a down payment on a house, college tuition. Um, and um, so, and that would be funded by the government. So that's one of the things I talk about at the end of the book and they call it baby bonds because, you know, once you're born, you start receiving this. And, uh, and what you receive in the end um, Basically, the lower your parents' income, the more money you receive um, out, of, out of this program. And uh, there, are various, there are various proposals like that around, but they, um, um, it has been estimated that that, that could cut the, um, the wealth gap. Well, actually, Morningstar estimated that that could cut, baby bonds could cut the wealth gap in half. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's, uh, those are all good points. I, I particularly like the idea of, of having the, having the kids actually write the checks to pay the bills. I wish I had thought of that. You know, um, we, we've got two young daughters that are now 20 and, and, and 17. And so we did a few things. As a matter of fact, my wife and I, we got an interesting text message from our older daughter, uh, who, who said, thank you. She was away at a conference and, and had to pay for her own seafood <laughs> two days in a row. <laughs> and said, thank you for, thank you for all that you did for me. I, I don't think I actually realize how much stuff costs sometimes. So uh, I, I like the idea of having the kids uh, write out the checks uh, to you know, the extent that kids will actually write checks as we move into the future. Right. But that's another interesting point. Yes. You know, I, like to, I have a friend who's a financial advisor who, who teaches in the, uh, he teaches financial. Uh, he goes into uh, in the city neighborhoods in Washington and uh, and and teaches uh, financial planning to uh, high school students. And and you know he said basically he wrote on a um, blackboard. He was writing down expenses. Uh, so he's asking the kids. So how much is the cable bill? How much is your uh, you know is your uh, cell phone bill? They had no idea. <laughs> yep. Right. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> I totally get it. I totally get it, man. Now, now that's interesting. And, and it provides a nice segue. Uh, your friend that's a financial advisor teaching uh, there in the D.C. area. You know, many years ago, one of the initiatives uh, as a part of the Financial Planning Association was a, a bit of a push to get financial literacy taught in schools. And so just recently down in Florida, uh, they passed some legislation uh, that, you know, began, oh, more than 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and I think starting next school year, so for the 2022 through 2023 school year, uh, there will be a course for Florida high school students uh, on financial literacy in, in order for them to graduate from high school. And it'll cover some of those things like, uh, you know, financial institutions and, and banking and, and also things like credit and budgeting. Uh, do you think that's a good idea or perhaps a, a good start to uh, making some changes in, in what we're seeing? Well, I think that's, I think that that's critically important um, to do it at the high school level. And a number of states have actually uh, instituted um, some of some of them are mandatory, um, and some of them are not. But it has been a growing trend, um, and um, you know you won't. 
you know, you won't see kids, you know, if that's the case, you're not going to see kids going to college without knowing, you know, the basic fundamentals of uh, right. of financing and and uh, exactly. you know and 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 having a checking account. You know, I I I I had I knew nothing about a checking account when I went to college. <laughs> I had to figure it out myself. You know, go to the bank and but um, you know it's you know the it, you know it it will cover more than the basics. But that's a growing trend among states to require. Um, some sort of uh, financial literacy courses, um, and and I'm glad to see that trend uh, is is continuing. Yeah, good deal, good deal. You know, we we touched earlier about housing and and you know the exacerbation of the gap uh, through the course of the pandemic. Um, are there any other things through the course of the pandemic that you've seen uh, as both perhaps a threat? or on the other side of the coin, an opportunity, uh, any silver linings that have been exposed, if you will, through the course of the pandemic, as we've seen so many areas of our life uh, change? Um, I have, okay, I've done a couple of stories, uh, basically on whether Black Americans are coming out of this pandemic in better or worse shape. Um, and the most positive thing I could say is, is we're, we're going out, we're coming out um, at the same, at the same um, levels that we went in. In other words, not, nothing has really improved. Um, and in some cases uh, worse, um, you know, one of the, one of the ways we were impacted was uh, more, more than white Americans was, was, was the employment and jobs and the wages. Um, and the government, um, the government assistance helped uh, immensely there. But you know, if you look at who, who, who was in, who lost their jobs, okay, um, and that was service workers. Uh, you know, hotels are still way, way under, uh, under, under um, where they were in terms of staffing, and many of those people were people of color. You know, black and Hispanic. Um, in Washington D.C., um, you know, I talked to the president of the union uh, uh, that represents uh, hotel workers, uh, and um, a year after, you know, what, uh, you know. Um, Almost two years after after the pandemic, some of these uh, many of his union members are still without jobs, and hotels are and they're lo- they're in danger of losing their homes and their cars, um, and hotels are calling some of these workers back with a fraction of the hours because you know whereas whereas they used to like you know um, when you go to a hotel they would um, clean your room daily you every know, day and now, and now you know most of the time it's like two maybe three times you know if you stay for a week um, it's not every day um, and um, and that may be something that they stick to long term but hotels are nowhere near uh, and, and, and some of the big conventions uh, cities like Washington New York hotel workers are nowhere near where where they were in terms of employment. So in terms of employment, um, we suffer greatly. Uh, you know, uh, you know, there's been a lot made of the Great Resignation. Um, and if you look around, and I've talked to a number of uh, African American ministers, uh, and uh, you know, they say, yeah, you can see a bunch of jobs are available, but they're all minimum wage jobs, okay? They a job at fast food places. Uh, and those are the people who are still looking the most. Um, you know, so those are the, those are the vacancies that are out there. So uh, you're, 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 you've seen um, basically black folks have uh, lost jobs, they've lost income and, and are st- further behind than they were a couple of years ago because of the pandemic. Gotcha, gotcha. And it's, it's interesting that you bring up the great resignation. Um, and, and so there's this idea or theory uh, that as a result of people, I guess, uh, being forced to the sidelines, so to speak, because of the pandemic, some people just decided, you know, I've made this sort of life decision that I'm just going to shut it down. But we're 
you know, I'm, I'm seeing and hearing some different things along that. So broadly speaking, what are, what are some of your thoughts about this idea of the great resignation? Um, you know, I've, I've tried really hard to find out um, how much Black Americans participated uh, in the great resignation. And there are no real numbers. Um, but um, I think the type, the type of jobs um, that people are um, basically, it, it, it was an opportunity to leave low wage jobs. I mean, in, in that sense, um, fast food jobs, um, they pushed up the income. Um, sorry, they pushed up the uh, the wages. So so now the, uh, you know working at McDonald's or you know um, or any other you know Kentucky Fried Chicken or you know um, or even um, Walmart, um, it, uh, the wages are higher, um, but they're still not not at a point where someone can um, someone can uh, support a family. Um, so my my feeling is that the great resignation um, that uh, that took place among um, white collar and clerical jobs um, um, did not offer more opportunities for the people who are underrepresented in are unrepresented in those positions. Um, they didn't provide more opportunities you would think for black Americans and for the Latinos and even for older Americans who who are face you know an incredible amount of um, age discrimination uh, you would think you you would think this would offer more opportunities for uh, for older Americans and I haven't seen that at all got it got it got it so let me ask you this question so I mentioned you know my wife and I we've got a couple of young daughters and, and one of them will be graduating from college here in a few weeks uh, so I'm, I'm gonna take a, a walk down memory lane if you will and uh, you're about to leave to go to Cornell University I think it is um, what were some of the discussions in, in your household about going away to college and, and deciding on what you would major in and perhaps what that uh, presented for your economic possibilities as a as a young man heading off to college. Um, I was the first person in my family to go to college. So, uh, and at that point, uh, my father died when I was sixteen. So it was just my mother who was supporting us, and she was not able to contribute a great deal. So, so I can't. So, so my so. You know the the most advice I could get from my mother is just take care of yourself and do good, do well, have good grades, um, because there was no no person, no father figure who could have that conversation with me that you're talking about. I I I knew from junior high school what I wanted to do, and that was be a journalist. So so I knew that. Um, and the rest of it was figuring it out for myself. And at that time, um, I think, you know, the, the same could be said for many of the young Black students uh, who were first time, first time, uh, um, the first in their families to attend college. Um, we, we were, we had to figure it out for ourselves. And some of us did, and some of us didn't. You know, some, 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 some of the, uh, some of our friends we saw for that first year and never saw or heard from again. <laughs> um, and those were the ones who couldn't figure it out. So, um, you know, and uh, luckily there were there were um, support systems in place at Cornell with black administrators who who you could talk to and, and who would actually help you figure out the finances and, and figure out basically um, life. <laughs> because, you know, we were a bunch of kids, you know, 18 years old and off on, off on our own. Um, so there was not a lot of guidance. And, and you know, um, it's not like, you know, my kids going off to college. They, we talk, we talk for months about, about, you know, um, about um, what they wanted to major in and, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, how, how we might finance it and, you know, and when they needed money, um, you know, um, but, but, you know, I was in that group where um, my mother couldn't afford to send me, <laughs> to send me money. So I had, I had to work, I had to work, I had to get work study jobs and, uh, 
Um, so I think that's, you know, that's an important conversation to have. Um, but, um, you know, back then, <laughs> we didn't have the benefit of having that, you know, having parents with that kind of experience. Who sure. Could, could tell us how, how, what to do and how to do it. I, absolutely. You know, I, I, I was perhaps a, a generation removed, but candidly, my experience was no different. Uh, first person in college. And it, it's funny, I chuckled as you were uh, telling that story about the people who were there the next year. I went to Georgia Tech and literally during orientation, uh, perhaps for a bit of a different reason, there was a part of orientation that said, look to your left, look to your right get to know that person because when you come back next year some of you aren't going to be here and, and, and it held very very true so uh i, I can totally relate to that um you know as we're, we're wrapping up here we talked about a lot of things are there any topics or any things around uh the area of financial literacy or uh things we can do to close and overcome that racial wealth gap uh are there anything uh any things we didn't touch on that you think would be really important for our audience to know about? Um, one of the biggest things I'd say is, is 401ks. Um, you su- I'm sure you're not surprised, but people, people are surprised um, at, the, at the people who don't take advantage of the company match. And, and, you know, financial planning, we always call it free money because if you don't if you don't contribute, the company won't match in many cases. So um, and um, and that that's not just uneducated people who aren't doing that. Um, you know, I had a, um, I talked to one financial planner who had um, a client who was making um, you know mid six figures, and she was contributing two percent to her four hundred one k. When the company was matching up to six percent, okay, and he put the numbers down for her to show her how much she was losing. So, so you know, for just like I was talking about um, stock participation in the stock market, um, white Americans participate in retirement plans at a rate of sixty percent versus thirty percent for Black Americans. Um, you know, for various reasons. I mean, um, you know that, but. The thing is, if you have, if you have access to a company sponsored 401k, 403b, you must, you must contribute at least up to the company match. Absolutely, absolutely, it's, it's tremendous. And as you say, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I'm I'm not surprised because I I have in fact in my years as a a certified financial planner. Unfortunately, I've run into that any number of times. And so, uh, you know, that's a that's a great way to wrap things up today. Uh, you know, I just want to thank you, Rodney, for being here. I congratulate you on your induction into the Hall of Fame. Uh, congratulate you and thank you for taking the time, the energy, and the passion to write a book about fixing the racial wealth gap. Uh, thank you for being on the show and all the things you've done through the years and that you'll continue to do. So uh, with that, Family and friends out there watching, level up with Lee. Uh, Look forward, you know, share it with your friends, and we'll be back again next week with more ways to level up your finances. Thanks and have a great one.